like her business. It truly deserves its reputation as one of the world's great aircraft. The hugely successful F-18 Hornet hits the sweet spot between high performance and financial bottom line. Despite its brilliant design, this plane almost never saw production. I'm Paul Max Moga, and I've flown some of the most sophisticated planes ever built. And I'm here on the flight line at Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia Beach, Virginia home to 17 strike fighter squadrons of F-A-18 Hornets and Super Hornets. This lightweight fighter fills a variety of roles. Air superiority, fighter escort, reconnaissance, suppression of enemy air defenses, forward air control, close and deep air support, and day and night strike missions. On this episode of Great Plains, we'll tell the amazing story of the F-A-18 Hornet. I'm Lieutenant Mike Seegers of VFA 136, the Nighthawks. What we have behind here is a brand new Lot 30 F-18E Super Hornet. We've been flying for about four years now. Well, Mike, I appreciate you taking a couple minutes to explain the Hornet to us. Tell us what model we're at right here. What, what version of the Hornet are we at? Uh, this is the F-18 Echo Super Hornet. That's the single seat version of the Super Hornet. That's a Lot 30, just rolled off the line in January. So this plane is pretty much brand new. Brand new. And, uh, it's very new for Navy guys to see that. Most of the guys that have been around for 15 or 20 years have never seen a brand new airplane. So this is, uh, this is a pretty neat thing. Its story begins in the 1950s. America, locked in a Cold War, struggles with the fact that Russia no longer lags behind American aeronautical design. In fact, Russia's remarkable post-war developments include a series of bomber designs that shocked the NATO allies, just as their earlier MiG fighters had done. This is the Russian Tu-16, which NATO names the Badger. An extremely advanced aircraft for its time, it gets its power from only two engines, the largest and most powerful jet of its day. The Badger's full swept wing, high speed, and substantial bomb load make it a major threat. But its limited range confines its use only to potential European conflicts. No such constraint hinders the TU-95, NATO designation, the Bear. This design proves a shrewd investment for the Soviet military, its sole user for over 30 years. Its jet-driven propeller enhances its range enough to reach North America from Russian bases. But nothing creates a larger strategic threat to the U.S. than the M4 Bison. The Bison combines pure jet speed with the invasive range of the Bear.
When Western planners discover the existence of the bison in the 1950s, they don't know it isn't in wide production. They respond to the potential threat of this fast, high-flying craft by developing a different kind of weapon, air-to-air -air rockets. Early Super Sabres, Delta Daggers, some Voodoos, and Northrop Scorpions get fitted with these non-guided rockets designed for high speed, high climb, and long range, all dedicated to responding to the perceived Russian threat. If conflict comes, jet fighters from Air Defense Command can deploy thousands of rockets to provide a wall of destruction against the new Russian aircraft. The arms race has begun. Before long, the massive, simple, unguided weapons give way to much larger and more sophisticated technology. Some missiles, now guided, even contain nuclear warheads. Fired well ahead of the launching fighter, these missiles create a ferocious nuclear barrier unrivaled by conventional rockets. The aircraft firing these missiles have to fly fast and high, but because they're intercepting the enemy bombers rather than engaging them, they no longer have to be light or maneuverable. This change in tactics spawns a whole new breed of fighter plane, the Interceptor. But production of this new breed of aircraft results in some unintended consequences. The shift away from dogfighters leaves the Air Force deficient during the Southeast Asian conflict. The Delta Daggers, perfectly suited to protect American airstrips and other installations from North Vietnamese bombers, sit idle when no attacks come. And they prove useless in the scenarios that do play out. Vietnam is a different war, and the U.S. Air Force confronts aircraft that fit the older definition of fighters. Highly mobile, fast and efficient, in some ways almost primitive. Against Western technology, North Vietnamese MiGs hold their own in dogfights. The U.S. F-4 Phantom can dish it back. Very fast and extremely powerful, it fires several types of guided missiles, deployed by a second crew member. The Phantom proves the best the U.S. can offer against the Agile MiG, but it isn't ideal. The F-4 is originally designed as a Navy interceptor, not a true dogfighter. Losses are heavy on the U.S. side. Out of the 5,195 built during 1958 to 1981, 761 were lost in the Vietnam War. Even before the conclusion of the conflict, the Navy searches for an interceptor better suited for air-to-air -air combat. It finds its answer in the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. With limited carrier space, the Navy seeks the most versatile hardware money can buy. The Tomcat uses variable swept wings for flexibility, providing agility despite its size. Armed with the Phoenix missile, it achieves a range the Air Force has only dreamed about. Its flexible design enables it to carry the same weapons the Phantom uses over Vietnam, plus a cannon for dogfighting. While the Navy goes for a multi-purpose replacement for the F-4, the U.S. Air Force commissions a dedicated air superiority fighter, the McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle. 